Good afternoon, good morning, Sabah al Khair, Bokir Tov. Um, we are starting now our first joint webinar in the US of IPPNW, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, and METO, the Middle East Treaty Organization. And um, without saying much more, my name is Sean Dolev, I'll be the moderator. I'm the executive director of the Middle East Treaty Organization. Our next speaker is Jamal Abdi, and he's the president of National uh, Iranian American Council, NIAC. Uh, NIAC is a non-partisan, non-profit organization giving voice to the Iranian-American community. NIAC is the largest Iranian-American grassroots organization in the country. Previously, Jamal worked in the U.S. Congress as policy advisor on foreign policy, national security, and immigration issues. I'm looking forward to hear what you have to say. Thanks. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, uh, Sharon. Um, and thanks for not reading my whole biography. Um, you caught me mid-sip. Um, so given where we are today, uh, discussions about a nuclear WMD-free zone may feel um, a little distant and theoretical, uh, but I think it's important to remember that for decades, um, experts, advocates were saying that uh, a deal with Iran was possible. And for years, we had uh, folks pushing back up until the very end uh, as to whether Iran would ever agree to restraints on its nuclear program uh, and to whether Iran uh, would actually uphold the terms of its agreement. Uh, you know, uh, I remember, uh, I think, then Secretary, maybe, maybe candidate Hillary Clinton saying very clearly, we don't even expect the Iranians to uphold the terms of their uh, of the nuclear commitments. Uh, and lo and behold, Iran did hold up its commitments and it was the United States and our um, political uh, divisions uh, that, that ended up uh, causing us to not uphold our obligations. Um, so I think uh, some of the, the dire predictions here in Washington and elsewhere uh, may be less about what is possible and more about protecting um, entrenched views of the region and the status quo arrangements in the region that benefit uh, the very few. Uh, and, and harm very many. Um, I think I, I, I completely agree with um, everything Kelsey said. Uh, and I really do think that the JCPOA is the key to unlocking all of these opportunities that we're discussing about resolving the challenges uh, in, in the Middle East through diplomacy and through solutions that are positive some and mutually beneficial to uh, all the parties of the region. Uh, rather than the current zero-sum contest of, you know, one side wins, the other side loses, um, that we're currently uh, stuck in. Um, the JCPOA is, I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's obviously, it's a, it's a nuclear agreement, it's a non-proliferation deal, and it should be evaluated in those terms. But for, for me personally, and I think for many Iranian Americans, um, uh, many others who, who want this deal and who want peace, the JCPOA is not just about limiting Iran's nuclear program, which is really important and, and, uh, and, and vital, uh, but it's also about creating these uh, terms where um, Iran internally is actually able to progress politically and where you, you know, can actually see some positive reforms inside of Iran as it engages with the rest of the world, um, as it has to countenance the fact that it is no longer this isolated so-called rogue regime, but is now being expected to be a, a, a productive uh, player in the global economy and in international relations. And I think that just that accountability and giving Iran, you know, the benefits of this deal and something to lose and those, those opportunities, uh, I think will have dramatic impacts, positive impacts for the Iranian people, uh, for the future of Iran, and in so doing for, for future opportunities for diplomacy in the Middle East, future opportunities for greater stability, uh, and bottom line, uh, greater opportunities for peace and prevention of war and uh, uh, risks to American lives and lives throughout the Middle East. Um, I know that's a that's a lofty goal for a uh, for a non-proliferation agreement, but what we're really talking about here is breaking this you know four decades of tensions and antagonism between the United States and Iran, and the three decades it's it's less uh, of tensions between uh, Iran and uh, and Israel. Um, 
I am like Kelsey, I am bullish on the prospects for success uh, in these current negotiations. Uh, but obviously I am also very worried. Um, you know, we, we had a breakthrough. We finally had the, the US and Iran, if not talking directly to each other, at least in the same building, talking about the same thing. Uh, and I think very close to um, getting to a point where they can engage directly. Uh, I also think that the differences between the two sides are actually, um, ha have been made to sound more complex than they really are. Um, I think everybody actually knows what the deal entails. I think for the Iranians, it's very straightforward what they need to do on the nuclear side to roll back their program and put, put constraints uh, over it once again. Uh, for the United States, I think it's a little bit murkier. There's some, there's uh, a lot of gray area as to which of the sanctions need to be removed as part of the JCPOA and which potentially stay in place. Um, but even there, I, I have been led to believe that, you know, the administration understands what those obligations are. Um, and now it's a matter of uh, dotting the I's, crossing the T's and getting the sides to agree to the details. Now, maybe that's an oversimplification, but the sides are so close to a deal and it's just a matter of, of um, getting over that last step. This attack on the Tans over the weekend, the attack on the, the Iranian ship uh, during the negotiations last week, uh, I think portend some, some very big obstacles imposed by uh, America's friends and allies in the region. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I don't know how, what, what better example of the tail wagging the dog you can, you, you, you could, uh, put together than the United States being involved in multilateral negotiations to pursue one of the top foreign policy, uh, agenda items of the sitting president and to have, um, a client state, uh, directly working to sabotage those negotiations. Uh, and the fact that the United States, you know, I think has taken great pains, the Biden administration to separate, to distance itself from the attacks, um, but has not condemned them. Uh, and I think that maybe speaks to this, this hope by the Biden administration that they are going to be able to bring the Israelis and the Republicans and the Saudis along with whatever comes out of this, which I think right now may be a little bit, uh, uh, overly optimistic. Um, but, but I, I really think that what this also speaks to is what this deal and what these negotiations mean for the region. Um, because this is about the United States being able to talk to more than just its best buddies. Um, this is about the United States actually having options to be able to talk and negotiate to all the parties in the region and not be beholden to one or two interests, uh, which may in, in many circumstances not align with US interests. Um, Right now, the Netanyahu government does not want to return to the JCPOA. The Biden government does. As an American citizen, as a voter, I think I think Biden should have the prerogative to, to return to that deal. And I think that we should be working to prevent other parties from sabotaging it. But the reason that these parties are sabotaging it is because this deal does, um, you know, it, it threatens status quo. Um, it threatens a status quo in which you have the region divided between um, the U.S., Israel, and the Saudis, and then Iran and the so-called axis of resistance. Um, and because of that division, the United States is limited in its options of how it deals with the region, and the United States is not able to actually pursue its interests in the region. We can only pursue what our allies allow us to pursue, uh, which I, I think is, is so disastrous. And I think anybody seriously evaluating this should understand how problematic that is, um, that, that the United States apparently has permanent allies rather than permanent interests, which is the reverse of what it should be. Um, I think a breakthrough with the JCPOA, um, you know, it opens the door as the Biden administration has said, you know, they want this deal and then they want to talk about longer and stronger, which even longer and stronger, I mean, we're here talking about nuclear free zone, even longer and stronger feels a far ways away uh, from where we currently are. Um, but recognizing that this is, you know, this is a phased approach. These things, it's not, you know, we get everything with Iran or we get nothing with Iran. We have to do this in a strategic way. This is a chess game, not a checkers game. Um, and uh, so, so, I, so I, I think that, you know, if we, if we can get a deal, then as Biden said, we'll move to these longer, talk, stronger talks and regional talks. And the Biden administration wants to push the parties in the region to have these negotiations with each other to resolve these issues. And I think fundamentally, this is actually the most important potential implication of the JCPOA. Um, 
it's that I think that the United States role in the region has been to distort the uh, the regional dynamics and the politics in a way that maybe achieves some short-term gains. For instance, we Saddam Hussein is no longer there, and then in the long term has been really devastating to uh, U.S. interests and regional stability. Um, and until we are able to, uh, to to change that, and I think that only happens with the JCPOA, we're going to be bogged down in the situation where the Israelis feel that they are able to attack Iranian facilities and subvert U.S. diplomacy, and there's not a price to pay. Uh, the, the, the Saudis feel that, um, for instance, after the 2015 nuclear deal, the Obama administration gave its imprimatur for the, the siege of Yemen and sold the Saudis a bunch of weapons and tried to dole out a bunch of favors to the parties in the region to go along with the deal, rather than uh, demanding that these parties understand how this deal pertains to them, how this addresses what they need to do, and putting the onus on them to actually deal with these things. Putting the onus on the parties to actually deal with these challenges, rather than, in the case of some of our good friends in the region, using the big bully of the United States as their backup to sort of act with impunity. Um, and this is not to let Iran off the hook for all of the you know nefarious things that they're doing, but from a U.S. perspective, um, I think that our role in the region, we've put our thumb on the scale in a way that has um, uh, inhibited the parties in the region from needing to actually come to the table and get serious about this. That, okay, if we don't want a war, we do need negotiations. Um, if we do want to pursue our, our agendas, we can't rely on a constant U.S. military presence. We do need to negotiate and resolve these things. And I'll just conclude, I think that's also the case inside of Iran, uh, where the United States role has put its, its finger on the, on the scale and distorted the politics inside of Iran. And I think with the JCPOA and a reduction of the sanctions and the tensions, we can end that sort of negative impact inside Iran and in the region to explore opportunities for better things in the future.